Good morning, friends. Welcome to St. Thomas Anglican Church. It's good to be with you this morning. It's a beautiful morning. Um, if you are here with us in the pavilion, do know there are bulletins over uh, right on my left, your right. There are also restrooms across the street should you need it. Um, if you are online, welcome. We're glad you're participating with us today as well. Um, you can grab a bulletin from our website. You'll see the service bulletin, and you'll be able to follow along uh, with the liturgy, and you've got the readings, all the songs, everything you need to participate in worship today. Um, our processional hymn is Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. I invite you, if you're with us in the pavilion, to stand, and let's sing this together. Christ is risen, let us pray. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open. It's the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. Standing if you'd like, let's sing our songs of praise together.
God, who truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal glory. We pray this through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first lesson this morning is Psalm 66, verses 1 through 11. Be joyful in God, all you lands. Sing praises to the honor of his name. Make his praise to be glorious. Say to God, how wonderful are your works. Through the, gener through the greatness of your power shall your enemies cower before you. For all the world share, for all the world shall worship you, sing to you, and praise your name. O oh, come and see the works of God, how wonderful he is in his doing toward all people. He turned the sea into dry land, so that they went through the water on foot. Therefore in him let us rejoice. He rules with his power forever. His eyes keep watch over the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Bless our God, you peoples, and make the voice of his praise to be heard. Who holds our soul in life and does not allow our feet to slip. For you, O God, have proved us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the snare and laid trouble upon our backs. You allowed men to ride over our heads. We went through the fire and water, but you brought us out of place of plenty. This season, we are going to say the Pascha Nostrum together, so I invite you all to stand and we say this together. Hallelujah! Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Alleluia! Christ being raised from the dead will never no longer have to be over him. The death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. 
If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot see, cannot receive, sorry, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Yet a little while and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. And that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has, command, has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Father, I ask now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. For you alone are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated if you're here with us in the pavilion. Good morning. It's great to be here with you. Uh, you may have seen that earlier this week, uh, the CDC released new guidelines for fully vaccinated individuals. Uh, it was about protocols, whether you're indoors or outdoors. And concurrently, I noticed that two of our local, somewhat local Atlanta sports teams, the Braves and Atlanta United announced they will be expanding seating capacity to pre-pandemic levels this month. Uh, 40,000 plus people gathered. And it just occurred to me, do you remember full stadiums? Do you remember the roar of a crowd? The cheer at a sporting event, maybe a football game here in Athens or graduation coming up. A standing ovation at a sublime concert. Imagine the noise of Passover in Jerusalem thousands of years ago. Hundreds of thousands of people gathered to worship God. Or maybe just a few weeks ago, we celebrated Easter together after such a challenging, a particularly challenging year. There is something incredible about cheering after a victory, isn't there? Especially if we are rejoicing that God has won the day. I wonder, what was your last good memory of a huge group? family, groups, a congregation, raising this cacophony of noise, filled with joy and filled with wonder. That's what we have, the kind of scene we have, as we come to our passage for this morning. Uh, psalm 66, we're going to look at this Easter psalm, Psalm 66 together. Uh, it's a huge psalm of praise, indeed all of creation to exalt and what God has done, to rejoice in the victory of God Almighty. Uh, it's not simple. There is nuance and depth in this psalm. It starts with this incredible uh, call to praise God for who he is and what he has done. It's interesting. Uh, psalm 66, and we're going to be looking at actually the BCP translation. Uh, the verses are a little different than some of our normal translations. Um, but what you'll notice is that this particular chapter, Psalm 66, uh, it's both a command to worship and a, a broad invitation to both bring others to worship and to welcome others in giving God the honor rightly do his name. The psalmist will root uh, this praise in God's work on behalf of his people, um, and he roots it both in the big story of redemption what God has done for all of his people in the past, as well as these individual moments of when God has worked to deliver you and me. He has delivered this psalmist. Um, it's a psalm of worship and redemption, difficulty, and finally deliverance and rest in the Lord. Uh, by the way, if you know this psalm or if you're looking along in a Bible, um, you'll realize we're only going to cover about two-thirds of the psalm this morning. That's our assigned portion uh, from the lectionary. 
uh, the last third of the psalm will take all of this corporate praise and, and make it personal. Uh, it concludes with this kind of personal recommitment and the praise of this individual who wrote the psalm. And there's even this new kind of resolve, a new commissioning uh, to share this praiseworthy news with others. Uh, both what God has done broadly and how he has worked in this individual's lives. And so similarly, as we look at our portion, just the first two thirds of Psalm 66, um, I hope we're encouraged. Um, I hope you're encouraged uh, with a renewed call to praise the Lord and, and invite others into that praise. Uh, but also like that last third, I hope that for each of us, there's some sense of a recommitment uh, to God who delights in our praise. Here's our prayers and extends his mercy and loving kindness to you, to me, and to all that he has made. So let's look at this psalm together. Uh, the first part is filled with exclamation points in my mind. Be joyful. Come and see. And in these first verses, we see the psalmist as a worship leader. He, he's giving instructions. He's exhorting response. He's issuing an invitation and there's an interesting link right at the start between the worship of God and our own joy. That, that somehow when we are giving God the honor and praise due his name, uh, there is something beautiful and joyful and good that comes back to us as we do so. Here, be joyful. It is set in parallel to sing praises and make his praise to be glorious. Um, this is not specific. It's a universal call. Here it says, all you lands, be joyful in God, all you lands. In other words, all of creation, everything, human, non-human, the natural world, the animal kingdom, plants, rocks, waters, the sky, the sea, planet, constellations, everything. Be joyful and sing praises for the honor of his name. And make his praise to be glorious. Um, I love that in verse 2, um, we actually even declare to God all that he has done. To say to God, how wonderful are your works. Through the greatness of your power shall your enemies cower before you. Isn't that interesting? Do you think that God needs to be reminded of who he is and what he's done? I mean, he knows everything, right? He knows who he is. He knows what he's done. Yet the psalmist says... Go ahead and tell it to him again. He'll delight to hear it. We'll bring joy uh, to the Father. And, and I think part of that is that as we join the worship of all of God's good creation, as we declare to God all who he is and what he has done, um, in some ways we're also declaring that to one another, aren't we? And we're reminding and declaring to ourselves again also. This is who our God is. This is what our God has done. Um, that's actually part of what's great to be together again. That, that we can actually declare to one another the mighty works of God, who he is and what he has done. Uh, verse 3 actually takes faith, I think, to read. It says, for all the world shall worship you, sing to you, and praise your name. And the reason that takes faith, of course, is that right now the whole world doesn't seem to worship God, right? There's a lot in our world that does not seem to sing the praises and the honor do his name and, and make the praise of God to be glorious. There's sin and brokenness and sadness, disease, all of these things. But the psalmist looks ahead in hope. You see, if presently the whole earth does not bow down to God, we can envision when it will. That's the Easter hope of when the kingdom comes in its fullness. And when God's glory floods everything and everything is renewed and made new and we dwell with the Lord forever. That's what I see when I read this. For all the world shall worship you, sing to you, and praise your name. Uh, John Goldingay is an Anglican Old Testament scholar. And he points out here that the awesomeness of God's deeds means... This is so certain that this will happen, that in an act of worship, we can see it as if it's already occurred. For the nature of worship, I love this, is to collapse the distinction 
between visible reality and true reality. What we see around us and what we know to be true by faith. And so speaking again of this link between joy and worship, uh, between rejoicing in our own enjoyment and delight for a moment, it's worth pausing to say, why does worshiping God bring us joy? And why does God ask us to worship him? That's a little odd, right? I mean, if I had my two kids and brought them up here and said, hey, would you tell me how great I am? It's weird. That, that seems weird. It's, it's okay to admit in church. That seems a little weird at first blush. Well, one, God is not like us in that way. Um, God is perfect and holy and awesome and worthy and deserving of all this praise. Um, but also, I think God knows it's good for us to offer this praise. Um, one of the, the authors I like to read and quote, of course, is C.S. Lewis. Um, there are folks here gathered who know more about Lewis than I do, which is great, praise God. Uh, but he actually reflects on this. And C.S. Lewis says, I think that we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. That there's something in which praise completes what we are enjoying. He says, it is not out of compliment, for example, uh, that lovers keep on telling one another how beautiful they are. Uh, the delight is incomplete till it is expressed. C.S. Lewis says, it is frustrating to have discovered a new author and not be able to tell anyone how good he or she is. To come suddenly at the turn of the road upon some mountain valley of unexpected grandeur and then keep silent because the people you care uh, for it no more than a tin can in the ditch. In other words, you see this great thing and you want to share it with others. And for a moment, I do imagine C.S. Lewis on Twitter sharing via social media, but that's, that's a whole other thing. He says, fully to enjoy is to glorify. In commanding us to glorify him, God is inviting us to enjoy him, to complete our joy, to make it full by expressing our delight. That's why we see this beautiful invitation in verse 4. Oh, come and see the works of God. Come and see the works of God, how wonderful he is in his doing to all people. And honestly, I was reminded of some of these dynamics uh, last week. Um, how much we, we, we actually need to share in our delight to fully enjoy something. How we want to tell everyone, come and see this awesome thing that has happened. And of course, that is because of the, uh, the goal that Ezekiel Barco scored in last weekend's Atlanta United match. You saw this, right? Okay, who saw the goal that Ezekiel Barco scored in the last match? It was incredible. You should go home, even if you dislike soccer with a passion, and you should get on YouTube, and you should look up Barco Goal 2021, and you will sit there and go, the glory of God is a human fully alive, as St. Irenaeus said. You see, here's what happened in this, in this match. Um, there's a free kick. It's a little over 20 yards from the goal. Um, and, and Barco has it. So a free kick means you get a free shot. And, and the wall lines up. That's the barricade of people. They're going to, I guess, sacrifice their stomach to block the shot. And, and Barco is this little guy. I mean, he's five. Two, I'm looking at Robert. Robert knows the five, two, five, three, yeah. five, six. No, he's not. <laughs> okay, well, if you have cleats on, cleats kind of pick you up, maybe. Uh, so that's what's happening there with that five, six. Come on. Uh, anyways, he shoots the ball and it hits the wall. And you're like, okay, it's done. He just took another terrible free kick. That's what Marco does. And the ball bounces off. And he just drifts over. And just instinct takes over. And he hits this amazing shot. And if you know a soccer goal, the upper 90 is this amazing. It just hits the bar, kisses the post, and goes in. I mean, it is beautiful. And, and I'll tell you, as a soccer fan watching the beauty of this shot, 
And, and by the way, it made the number one replay on Sports Center. Do you know how good a soccer goal has to be to get number one on Sports Center? I mean, my entire family, half of who don't even like soccer, jump up screaming. I'm texting Robert and other people because you've got to share it. That, that, that completes your joy. Um, we got here to set up for church last week, and I said, Chris, get your computer out. You have to see this. You have to see this. Now, I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about these verses. Come and see the works of God, how wonderful he is in his doing toward all people. Um, Thursday, I was at a restaurant. I'm wearing an Atlanta United jersey, and the server goes, did you see Barco's goal? <laughs> yeah, I did. Let's talk about it. Um, isn't it interesting that, one, I could delight in something like that, something silly, right? It's, it's not of eternal weight or significance. Um, but I just shared it, naturally. It, it, I saw something amazing. It brought me joy. I shared it. There was nothing forced, nothing awkward. It was the most natural, normal thing in the world to share what had happened. The person at the restaurant, it, it, was, it made total sense for him to come talk to a stranger about Barco's goal that he had scored. And it just made me wonder, honestly, like how often do we catch a glimpse or a vision of God's beauty and glory in that way? That we would actually see something of the mighty person and work of God that, that would cause us to erupt in praise. That, that would cause us to naturally text a friend. That would cause us to say, you've got to see this. And casually talk to someone in a restaurant about it. Again, not forced, not awkward, natural and normal. We're called to share the good news of God with others. Oh, come and see the works of God. How wonderful he is in his doing toward all people. C.S. Lewis again, fully to enjoy is to glorify. So how are we called, you and I, to bring God glory and to invite others to behold his glory and to join in our worship and in the worship of all creation. All right, let's keep going in the psalm uh, because we move out of this call to praise uh, till we see the basis for it. The psalmist is going to praise God for deliverance and even difficulty in verses 5 through 11. Again, these are the, the verse numbers in the BCP. Um, it runs through about verse 12 if you're in another translation like the English Standard Version. But as the psalm continues, there, there's a shift from, from this general command, this invitation to joyfully praise God, to really just some broad stroke reminders of God's work in the lives of his people and in the lives of individual people. Um, if, you, if you know your Old Testament, you'll probably know that the major saving, redeeming work of God occurs in the Exodus. Um, that is the foundational story uh, for most of God's people in the Old Testament is the Exodus. Um, when the Israelites were enslaved uh, in Egypt and they cried out to God and he heard their cry for deliverance. He, he commissioned, he's going to work through Moses. Um, and, and there's this supernatural confrontation with, with Pharaoh and, and these oppressors. God sends plagues one after another. You've probably say, seen the Prince of Egypt, right? The animated version. Um, you see these plagues over and over. Um, they're kind of terrifying. Um, yeah, there's something you were like, oh, I don't know about that. That seems dangerous. Um, and, and in one of those, you see um, the, the Passover is established. And the Passover meal is established. And there's this moment where God's people... We're, we're told, hey, something's going to happen. What you need to do is you need to sacrifice. 
And you need to take the blood from that lamb, the Passover lamb, or uh, in church terms, the Paschal lamb. We talk about that in, the, in our Eucharistic prayer. You need to take that blood and you need to smear it on the doorpost of your home. And, and then, then you'll be passed over. You'll be kept safe. You'll be delivered. Um, and, and that becomes this motif that goes all through the Bible. Um, and not that we, we like literally go get a lamb and, and, and kill it and get the blood and smear it on our doorpost. That, that's weird, right? Uh, we, we would probably be really worried if any of you did that. Please don't do that. Um, but instead, we're told that there is another lamb. Um, actually, when John the Baptist sees Jesus, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, the, the, the true Passover lamb, the true Paschal lamb whose blood redeems us. And it's not smeared on our exterior uh, doorpost of our home. It's, it's, it's applied to our hearts. And that's how the blood of the lamb works. And then God's people are redeemed and they're delivered. Back in the Exodus, they, they, they plunder um, their oppressor. Then they set off on just kind of like a mass caravan, if you think about it that way. Um, and eventually Pharaoh pursues them and they find themselves trapped. They're between the army of their enemies and, and this rushing water. That's a bad place to be, right? Trapped between a chariot and a wet place. That's what's happening here, not a rock and a hard place. And they wonder what's going to happen. And, and what happens is that God acts as only he can do. God makes a way when it seemed like there was no way. And he parts the sea and they walk across on dry land. That's what verse 5 is telling. That's the whole story condensed in this little, he turned the sea into dry land so that they went through the water on foot. Therefore, in him, let us rejoice. You're going to remember when God did that incredible thing in the Exodus. Remember when he delivered and saved and redeemed his people. That's the God whom we are praising. Um, hey, side note, that's kind of fun. So in the Anglican Church, uh, we talk about there being two sacraments, baptism and Holy Communion, right? Um, you actually see both of them in the Exodus, their roots. You see the Passover meal, um, which starts in Exodus and runs all the way through the Lord's institution of the Lord's Supper, all the way until we can anticipate the great marriage feast of the Lamb. Um, that's Exodus language that carries that through as a thread. And then also you have this idea of passing through the waters safely and being delivered. Well, friends, that's baptism. And so you see those right there. And I actually think it's okay to like actually hang all of that onto verse 5. Here are all the ways in salvation history that God has worked to redeem and deliver his people. Therefore, in him, let us rejoice. Uh, the Psalms work like this. They give us these little phrases, and they're like hyperlinks, or, or these shorthand slogans. And we can see all of salvation history hanging on it. And as Christians, we're even, given, I, I think, permission and maybe encouraged to even look back through the death and resurrection of Jesus and say, let's hang this on that as well. Because salvation history pointed ahead to it, and now look what God has done. Um, there are some manuscripts of this psalm in Greek, and they actually have the heading. It says, a psalm of the resurrection. And, of course, scholars say, we think this is a Christian influence. Well, of course. Um, and probably that psalm of resurrection is not original in Hebrew. But it just tells us, here's how God's people have seen and used and prayed and sang this incredible chapter of the Bible, Psalm 66. Um, we're called to give God praise for his mighty acts, his acts of salvation accomplished for us and accomplished for the whole world. And then from that kind of big picture view of what God has done, the psalmist will funnel down. I mean, he started with all creation, then he moved to salvation history, and now we see some interesting times, maybe of specific personal times of temptation and difficulty alluded to. Before we get to the last section, uh, look at verses 8 and 9. Who holds our soul in life 
does not allow our feet to slip. Verse 9, for you, O God, have proved us. Uh, you have tried us as silver is tried. And now look at these next few verses. You brought us into the snare and laid trouble upon our backs. You allowed men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and water. Uh, you brought us out into a place of plenty. Um, we don't know what all is being talked about there. Um, I will say the church has actually read verse 10 and said this is the Lord Jesus perfectly. Um, the one who was ensnared and had trouble laid upon his back uh, for us. But it's just interesting that, that we have all of, here's big salvation history, and then here's this psalmist's personal experience. And we don't even totally know what it is, but like this guy and this community, they went through some stuff too. And they were encouraged by what God had done for everyone, but they said, here's what God has done for us. And here's how he has delivered us here and now. Isn't that incredible? The scriptures do that. Um, they don't ask us to just focus on the big picture and ignore what's happening in our own lives. And nor do they call us to only be concerned about our own navels, our own lives, and miss the big picture. There's this beautiful balance. Um, and I think it's especially appropriate since we're talking about worship. Sometimes my life is really tough. And I actually need to go, you know, I'm praising you not because of how things are in my life right now, but because of this big story of salvation and what you have done and what I trust you will do in the future. And then sometimes I'm like, you know what? Like on Thursday, God did this. Let's give him praise for how he's working in the here and now. It's okay to feel that you go back and forth there, to hold that in balance um, and to apply that here as we think about Psalm 66. Um, and man, I just am so glad that in this psalm, which seems so just high and joyful, um, you see real life. And you see pain and you see difficulty. Um, when it says we went through fire and water, um, I think in Greek that's probably like we went through H-E double hockey sticks and back. I, I, we've got some little ones with us, so I'll just keep that uh, that way. But I think that's what he's saying. Like, this is not, I stubbed my toe. These are major issues that they have gone through. It says that you have proved us. You have tried us as silver is tried. This is like a blacksmith shop, right? And you, you heat the metal up and you shape it and you use the fire and the forge. At some point, you plunge it into water to cool it and prove it. And so you see these intense times of of heat and fire and water. Well, somehow they're forming in a blacksmith shop. That forms this, uh, this metal into something purposeful and useful. And I think the psalmist would say there's something like that going on as well with these trials, uh, with these difficulties that, that God is utilizing them um, to shape and to mold and to prepare. Um, this catalog of, of difficulty and hardship and temptation and calamity, fire and water, they're trapped and they're trampled. That was their experience. That, that's ours as well, isn't it? And I love this psalmist has a beautiful openness to how the Lord can use even terrible circumstances, um, not to destroy us, but to, to prove us, to, to refine us as silver. Um, and the psalmist isn't saying, look at what you did to us. He's saying, look at how you've used these things and permitted and allowed them and even redeemed them and transformed it to be something for our good and for your glory when it has seemed terrible. The New Testament picks up that theme. Uh, the book of James begins with a similar idea. Count it all joy, my brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, not lacking in faith. St. Paul put it this way in Romans 5, same idea. He says, more than that, we rejoice in our sufferings. It's a weird starting point for worship. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. 
Um, and I know that some of these verses have been used um, probably to, to encourage people to deny their actual experiences or, or ignore their emotions or to downplay real suffering and hardship. It's okay, suck it up, grit your teeth, what's wrong with you? Um, I, I get that folks have used those verses in that way. That's not what the Bible's doing. It, it's saying consider this great mystery of how the Lord can use suffering and hardship and difficulty uh, for his glory. And after all, that's the illustration. I mean, we're in Easter. That's what the cross is, right? I, I mean, the, the most suffering the world has seen, the most unjust thing that's ever happened. And yet in it, we see the love of God. And we see redemption, and so we rejoice. Um, after this really kind of tough catalog of hardship, the psalmist concludes, but you brought us out into a place of plenty, of abundance, redemption, abundance, rest. That's what we see in Psalm 66. Um, it is worth noting that Psalm 66 is looking back. Um, hindsight is 2020. If, can we use that anymore? Or is that like gone? I don't know. Hindsight's 2020. Um, th this psalm is not in the midst of the struggle, right? It's looking back to go, man, that was terrible. Um, now with a little bit of distance and perspective, I can see how maybe the Lord used it. And here's some good that has come out of it. How, how God's people have been tested and refined, even through crisis. Um, there's a saying that a good crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Have you heard that before? A good crisis is a terrible thing to waste. Um, John Golden Gay, that Old Testament Anglican scholar, said when you look at Psalm 66 and this crisis, he says such a crisis shows uh, whom you can really trust, where your security lies, and whom you recognize to be in control of the world. He says, crisis reveals character. And reading through that and thinking through these things and praying about it, um, I couldn't help but think about our own congregation. And kind of what we've been going through, obviously there, there's been a, a crisis everyone's gone through, right? Uh, this global uh, pandemic. And it's been this crisis both on a global level um, and on an intensely personal level. And I'm sure that we actually have very different experiences of how this has affected our lives. Um, some, I'm sure we know folks who have been really ill. Um, I know we, uh, Holly, she had an uncle pass away from COVID-19. Many of us have experienced um, death both in the news and all around us, but maybe in our own families, our own communities. Um, it's been tough. We, we've gone through fire and water. We've been, it's felt trapped and trampled, right? Um, and, and, and obviously Psalm 66, they're out the other side. I don't think we're totally out the other side at this point, but um, we're getting there. I mean, stadiums, as I mentioned, are opening up. Vaccinations are on the rise. Um, you see people smile and hug one another again. And they're like, you had your two shots? Okay, side hug. Um, things are moving in the right direction. Um, and it's just interesting to say, okay, well, what have we learned? How has God used us? How has this process proved and strengthened us like silver? Um, and I think that's true for, for us as a church, too. Um, and I would say that I'm, I'm, you know, I wouldn't have wished that last year on anyone. And I certainly would not have wished it on a young church getting started, but man, part of me is really um, maybe just reflective at this point of how God has used it to just strengthen this congregation and bring relationships together and, and carried us through this year. And, and I think, honestly, we're going to look back five, ten years and go, man, like, do you remember that really tough season and how God strengthened us and brought us together and then how that prepared us for what he did in the next few months and years? How he got us ready for the work that he wanted to do through us 
and through this congregation, St. Thomas, as we're getting our legs back under us, um, man, there are things we don't take for granted anymore, right? We're glad to gather and worship. We're glad to be with one another. Um, I think many of us have realized, John Goldingay said that the crisis helps you see who's in control. Despite all of our cognitive knowledge that we're not in control, Uh, man, has that not felt more real than ever? Someone does, hey, what's your five-year plan? Uh, pray and follow the Lord. <laughs> um, it's just helped us kind of go, okay, let, let's be a little more responsive. Let's be a little more dependent. Let's seek to see the Lord's leading. And, and as he's going ahead of us, even if things seem a little odd or don't make sense, let's see what God wants to do. Uh, we've been reminded who we can trust, where are in control of the world. So I just want to issue an invitation. Um, it's time that we can be in a new, a renewed season of worship and joy as the people of God. As the song says, be joyful, sing praise, come and see, share this with others. Remember what God has done for his people and what he has done for you, your household, your family. I mentioned the last third of this song is really personal. It's kind of the psalmist has given this call to praise. He's reflected on hardship and then makes this renewed commitment. I just want to read this last part um, as really a prayer for all of us as we close uh, the sermon today. So this is verses 12 uh, through 19. And I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand. We're going to say the creed in a moment. But let me pray this over us and then we'll move to the creed. Uh, and make this our prayer. I will go into your house with burnt offerings and will pay you my vows, even those which I promised with my lips and spoke with my mouth when I was in trouble. I will offer you burnt sacrifices of fat and beasts with the incense of rams. I will offer bullocks and goats. Then this verse 15. Come here and listen. All you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for me. I called to him with my mouth and gave him praises with my tongue. If I had inclined toward wickedness with my heart, the Lord would not have heard me. But God has heard me and considered the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, who has not refused my prayer or turned his mercy from me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father and Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried, on the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
for Foley, our Archbishop and Bishop, and Frank, our Assisting Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese, and for our congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ here in the Athens area, and for the many campus ministries. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And for all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, the one God, now and forever. Amen. And now, humbly confess our sins to Almighty God, saying together, Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you in our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways for the glory of your name. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent, and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite you to stand. Friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. I invite you to safely greet one another in the name of the Lord. quick uh, parish announcements. First, thanks so much for being here. It's great to gather and worship with you. And if you are a uh, guest of ours, we're so glad you've joined us today. Um, you're welcome to uh, go on our website, stacactives.org. Um, you can subscribe to our newsletter. We'd love for you to send an email to one of our team members just letting us know you're here with us. And we'd love to answer any questions you might have as you explore uh, St. Thomas Anglican Church. We've got some announcements in the back. Uh, thanks for our kids coming up this summer starting May 12th, um, as well as in June, we're going to have a, a really a chance for fellowship. Uh, dinners for nine, we call it. Uh, so just be on the lookout for sign-ups for those things. Um, and then uh, the offering. The offering, there's notes about the offering in your bulletin. Um, we do have a box in the back that you can drop a cash or check. You can also go online to our website to make a gift today, or even apparently text message. Um, hopefully that goes to the right place. I think it does. Um, or you can mail a check. Uh, hey, thank you for your ongoing uh, generosity during the season. We're grateful for the gifts given today and grateful for the gifts given all week that come in. Um, and we kind of, we acknowledge those in this moment in our, in our worship together. And um, that's kind of fun. Yeah, he's got a big truck. That's nice. Um, sorry, I got, I got distracted by the huge truck uh, accelerating there. Uh, let's reset just a moment. Let's listen to this passage from 1 Peter 2. Uh, reminding us of who we are in the Lord. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
Reflecting on this, let's sing our offertory hymn together. Come Holy Spirit, come. of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, for he is the true Paschal Lamb who was offered for us and has taken away the sin of the world, who by his death has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and dark angels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sing your only Son into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand to 
and glory that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he is betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, together, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, and this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him so that he may dwell in us and we in him and bring us with all your saints into the fullness of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and all glory is Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. And just a word about communion this morning. Um, this is a time for receiving communion, for prayer, worship, meditation. Um, the way we'll do that today, we tell our protocols in place, is that one of our communion servers will bring the communion elements to you there at your seat. And so if you'd like to receive communion, just remain standing. Um, if you don't want to receive communion, um, you can actually cross your arms. We'd love to pray a prayer of God's blessing over your life. You're also welcome to go ahead and be seated if you'd like. Um, once you receive communion, you can be seated also. That way we know that you've received. Uh, this communion is open to any baptized Christian. Uh, parents, if your kiddos are baptized, it's up to your discretion if they receive or not. And our server will usually look to you just to get an indication for that. They may ask you if, you, if the, the kids receive communion or not. Um, we'll bring you um, the communion elements. They are individually wrapped in these bags. It's a wafer suffused with wine. And as soon as you get that, you're welcome um, to consume and receive those elements and then be seated. Um, so let's come to the Lord's table together this morning. Let the 
pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out into the world to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, guards your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and his Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is Fairest Lord Jesus. Let's sing together.